So, we're supposed to be ambassadors for Christ. Hmm. Well, Miranda, don't you think we do a pretty good job at that already? I'm sure we do. But what is it that an ambassador does again? Well, an ambassador is someone that goes everywhere. They travel all around the world. And they get paid for it, which is that's pretty cool. They're supposed to represent their country really well. You know, we were to grow up to be ambassadors. Where would we be from? That's a good question. I mean, should we be loyal to our mom's country? You know, to Bolivia. Or should we be loyal to our dad's country, Texas? <laughs> Mijita, por favor, no matter what your father says, Texas is not a country. It's, it's not? not? <laughs> Since when did that happen? Por favor, <laughs> don't you remember the Alamo? Anyways, back to the ambassador thing. What is it that they do again? Well, an ambassador is supposed to do whatever their country or their leader tells them to do. You know, if like the king or the prime minister or the president asks them to do something, they're supposed to do it. No questions asked. At all. Ever. Um, I'm not sure I like that job. You know, everyone watching every move I make, making sure it's all about my country and not about me. Miranda, dear. Most people would consider that an honor, a privilege, to be an ambassador for their country, to represent the country that way. Well, I'm still not sure I'd like that job. I mean, think about it. Whatever somebody thinks about my country, whatever their opinions are towards my country, whatever their feelings are towards my country, they're going to think the same thing about me. Well, well that's true, but it's Dad's turn to speak. I'm still trying to get over the fact that Texas is not a country. <laughs> Where did that come from? Two or three weeks ago, I went into a store to check on our phone plan. I don't want to provide free advertising in church, so all I'll say is that it was a telephone company store. I went in to ask a few questions, and I wasn't going to be there long, but when I walked in, one of the store representatives, one of the store employees came up to me and said to me, Sir, if you just give me your phone number, just give me your account information, I'll be happy to check your account and see if we might be able to save you some money. Now, I don't know about you, but I was a bit skeptical. Whenever I have salespeople come up to me and say, I'm going to save you some money, I'm usually asking the question, how much is it going to cost me for you to save me some money? <laughs> and so I was a bit leery, a bit standoffish, a bit resistant at first. But she was fairly persistent. No, just give me your phone number, your account. I'll just check it. You don't have to do anything, and we'll see if we can save you some money. So finally, in a fairly begrudging way, I said, okay. So I gave her the phone number, the account information, and she went on the computer and began to look. After just a few minutes of looking, she looked up at me and said, you know what, I think we can not only save you some money, we can cut your bill almost in half. I said, now wait a minute, wait a minute. And I started asking her questions. I mean, I asked question after question after question. I kept waiting for her to get impatient with me, get put off with me, say, sir, well, listen, if you don't want any help, then forget the whole thing. But she didn't. She was patient. She was persistent. She kept typing, calling, and finally she came back and said, absolutely, that's what we'll be able to save you, and here's how we can do it. I said, are you sure? I'm sure. All right, then let's do it. Now, I walked out of that store feeling grateful, still a little uncertain, but when I paid that bill just a couple of days ago, and it was almost half what it had been before, I was singing her praises. I thought, here was a representative who could have grown impatient. In fact, I was in there a lot longer than I planned to be and probably longer than she wished I had been. But by the end, this is the result. I don't want to advertise phone companies in church. But I'll tell you, if you go into that store, 
Your horizon could be a lot better. I was so appreciative of that woman that I actually went online and sent an email to her boss and said she should be commended. Your store representative, patient and persistent, and it made a difference for me. Today we come to the end of a series entitled, The Best Thing You Can Do. We've been a lot of places in this series. We've been to boyfriends and girlfriends. We've been to fiancés and others. We've been to spouses and ex-spouses. But today, arguably, we come to the most important question of them all. The question simply is, what is the best thing you can do for your God? Now, I know that sounds a bit odd to ask because most of the time when we talk about God and Scripture and us, we're talking about what it is that the Scripture says God can do, God will do, God is eager to do for us. The Bible, after all, is filled with passages and promises and verses which talk about that very theme. But don't miss the fact that the Bible also has a great deal to say about what we can do in response to God's great love for us. And so that's the question with which I come to you today. What is the best thing you can do for your God? Now, no doubt there's somebody here today whose mind immediately goes to the Old Testament prophet Micah, to that sterling verse toward the end of his book that we all have read, in fact, probably memorized. It's in the context of this very kind of question. What is it that God expects of us? What can we do for God? Micah's response is clear. He has shown you, O oh man, O oh woman, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So that, you say, that would be my answer. Best thing you can do for God. And I would agree with you. It's a biblical response, a just response, a merciful response, and a humble response. Maybe we ought to just declare victory and go home. But somebody else, maybe a parent, says, well, now, wait a minute. I have a different thought on that because I know what it's like to be a parent and to call my kids and expect them to respond. So I think the very best thing we can do for God is to respond to his invitation. And you would go to Matthew's gospel, Matthew, where he records the words of Jesus, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am meek and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. So you, parents, say, that would be it for me. After all, as a parent, when I call my kids, best thing they can do is respond and come. So when Jesus calls us, invites us, tells us, come, maybe the best thing we can do is respond. Well, again, who could argue with that? But there's yet another person who says, I have an evangelistic heart. I was born with that desire to share Christ." with the world. So when I think about the best thing I can do for God, I go immediately to the Great Commission. Those last words, according to Matthew's Gospel, that Jesus spoke before he ascended to the Father. Looking at those disciples gathered with around him, he said to them, all power is given to me on heaven, in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go, make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. So you say, that's it for me. That evangelistic fervor, that passion to go out and to tell the world of a crucified, risen, and soon coming Savior. Well, all those and many others are very good possibilities. But they wouldn't be my answer. I'd like to point out the answer I would give to that question by inviting you to take your Bibles and to turn in the New Testament to Paul's second letter to the church at ancient Corinth. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Pew Bible, page 1722. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Allow me to set a bit of the context because here in 2 Corinthians, 
Paul gives a defense, the most passionate defense he gives at any point in time of his ministry. He gives his credentials. Here are my credentials to be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. As he comes to chapter 5, we can see overtones there of his own conversion experience. In fact, to set the context, I don't think I could do better than the words of New Testament scholar Paul Barnett. I didn't find anyone who said it as well as he did to set the context for what's happening in chapter 5. Listen to what Barnett writes. This passage is deeply personal and contains many autobiographical allusions, all rooted in Paul's experience on the Damascus Road when he accepted Christ. From then on, he lived for the one who had loved him and had died and risen again for him. Hatred for Christ, which had been Paul's controlling motive, had now been replaced by an overwhelming sense of Christ's love for him. He no longer regarded Christ in purely superficial terms as the crucified and therefore the accursed one, but as the one in whom God had been present to reconcile the world to himself. Moreover, in that decisive moment near Damascus, God gave the now enlightened Paul the ministry and the message of reconciliation, whereupon he constantly sought to persuade people to be reconciled to God. Let the Corinthians understand that what this man teaches is not merely one opinion among others, but it is the very outworking of his historic encounter with the risen Christ on the road to Damascus. So these words we are about to read in 2 Corinthians 5 are set in the context not only of Paul's defense of his ministry, but against the backdrop of his conversion to Christ and of coming to understand Christ's absolute and persistent love for human beings. So with that context in mind, 2 Corinthians 5, we will read three verses, verses 18, 19, and 20. Here's what Paul writes. He says, all this is from God. All of these things about his ministry, about God's love for him, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. There it is, right there in verse 20. We are Christ's ambassadors. Ambassadors. What is an ambassador? If you look it up in the dictionary, the dictionary will tell you something like this. An ambassador is a dignitary, a political dignitary of the highest order who is commissioned by a sovereign, a president, a king, a queen, prime minister, who is commissioned by a sovereign to go to another country to represent the country that sent them. An agent, an official of the highest order who represents their home country abroad. That's an ambassador. We come to Paul's words and he says, we are Christ's ambassadors. So maybe the very best thing you can do, maybe the very best thing we can do for God is to be authentic and faithful ambassadors. But now maybe you say to me, Randy, that sounds good. That sounds real nice. But to be honest, it sounds a bit like pious rhetoric. So we are Christ's ambassadors, and we are called to be faithful and authentic ambassadors. It all sounds good, but what exactly does that mean? What does it mean to be an ambassador for Christ? Well, I spent some time looking researching, trying to understand exactly what it is that ambassadors do. What are their duties? If we were to have a job description of an ambassador here, what would be included on it? Well, there are many duties, but I picked out the three 
that seem to be right at the top of most lists, three that seem to be central no matter who might be writing about it, three areas in which ambassadors have a great deal of responsibility. Number one, an ambassador has a commitment to education. Education, you say. What do you mean? Is the ambassador a teacher, a professor? Well, in a sense. It seems that here is the job description, one of the items on it at least, for the ambassador is that when you arrive at the country where you are going to represent your home country, in that country you are to help people understand what are the priorities, what are the principles, what are the passions at the heart of the country you represent and especially at the heart of the sovereign of that country. You are to help other people understand that. What is that country like? What do they stand for? What does the president want? That's one of the top responsibilities of an ambassador. Paul says, we are Christ's ambassadors. Which means then, one of the primary items we have to be interested in and occupied with is representing well the God whom we serve, educating people about that God, about what kind of God He is. So I press home the question to you, all of you who are ambassadors for Christ, what kind of God do you represent? After all, if you look around the world today, you will find that there is every kind of understanding of God imaginable available. All kinds of thoughts about God, all kinds of representations about who God is. So what kind of God do you represent? For some, it is a harsh and vengeful God. In fact, there may be some of you here today who say, I grew up with an understanding of God that said God was so angry, so wrathful against sin, that if I in any way stayed very close to it, I jeopardized my existence, certainly my eternal security. In fact, if there is even one sin that I somehow forget about and don't ask forgiveness for, I imperil my eternal future because God is looking and waiting and wanting to make absolutely certain. In fact, He will keep me out of His kingdom for that. Is that your God? Is that the God you represent to the world? If it is, it will determine a great deal of how it is that you explain God to those around you. Now, if we look at our passage today, it seems very clear the kind of God we serve. Did you catch it? Paul says one of the understandings we have about God is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's sins against them. Think about that. Paul is painting a portrait of a God that says God isn't looking for reasons to keep you out. God is looking for reasons to bring you in. In fact, he, he himself is in Christ stretching his arms around the world, wooing people to his heart, even going so far as to say, I don't count those things against you. Just come anyway. Come as you are. That's your God, according to Paul. I don't know that I've encountered a better story to illustrate that than the story told by Tony Campolo. If you've heard him tell it, bear with me for those who have not. It appears, according to the story, that Peter and Paul were at the gates of glory. Peter and Paul had been given the task and the list. Here's the list. Check and make sure that anybody who appears is on the list. If they're on the list, in they come. If they're not on the list, keep them out. And they took their job very seriously. They had their list, and they were checking it twice, wanting to know who was naughty or nice. And as the people came, if their names were on the list, they were welcomed in. If they were not on the list, sorry. But the problem was, Every time they went in the gates of the city in the evening, they kept finding inside of their people they had expressly turned away. How'd you get in here? Who let you in? 
They became increasingly agitated about that and increasingly focused on checking the list, making sure, being very careful to make certain that they didn't let people in who weren't there. Go in at night, there they were. They began to ask around, and finally one day, somebody came running out of the gates of the city and said, I found out, I found out, found out what? I found out how they're getting in. How are they getting in? It's Jesus. He's pulling them over the back wall. <laughs> Is that your God? The God of whom Paul writes when he says, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's sins against them. Just come anyway, he says. Come. I want you. You're welcome. What kind of God do you represent to the world? In fact, some people represent a God to the world that is a God who was somehow changed at Calvary. That before Calvary, God was angry and distant and vengeful. But at Calvary, he was able, able to hurl all his vindictive fury upon his son until that fury against sin was spent. And then afterwards, he was okay. Now we can be close to him. Is that your God? Let me read to you the words from the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary. Listen to what is part of your spiritual heritage. Reconciliation, speaking of this passage, reconciliation involves no change on God's part, for God never changes. It is not God who needs to be reconciled to humans, but humans who need to be reconciled to God. There has never been enmity on God's part. Humans sometimes conceive of God as a stern judge, angry with sinners, hard to be placated, unmerciful, ready to condemn. This characterization misrepresents him, misrepresents him, and is an affront to him. Christ did not have to go to the cross in order to appease God. Did you hear that? Christ did not have to go to the cross in order to appease God, but as a demonstration of His love. God did not demand the death of His Son, but gave Him out of a heart of infinite love. Do you know what that reminds me of? It reminds me of the words of Jesus the night before his crucifixion, John 16 and 17, when Jesus said, and I paraphrase using my own words, said to his disciples, don't think that I am here and my being here makes the Father love you more. No, the reason I am here is because the Father already loves you. And then in his prayer, he actually prayed this, Father, let them understand that you love them as much as you love me. That's your God. The God for whom you are an ambassador. The God whose name you go out to share with the world, to explain to the world, to live before the world. You are his ambassador. And you will at times encounter other understandings and other views of God that will clash with that. When you do, remember Paul saying, God was in Christ reconciling us to himself. The venerable New Testament scholar William Barclay experienced a tragedy of almost unimaginable proportions. Barclay and his wife's 21-year-old daughter and her fiancé were both drowned in a boating accident. Barclay says, I don't know quite how, but somehow we managed to stagger through the painful darkness that followed that period of time. And somehow through the merciful grace of God, we somehow were finally able to plant our feet on more firm soil. About that time, Barclay received a letter a letter writer that had taken issue with some of Barclay's theological premises. 
The letter writer wrote to Barclay and said, I know why God killed your daughter. God killed your daughter to save her from your heresy. Is that your God? Barclay said, I wished I had had the letter writer's address, for I would have written back and would have said to them the same thing that John Wesley said in a similar situation. Dear letter writer, your God is my devil. God didn't do that. God is in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. You're his ambassador. A part of an ambassador's duty is to educate in the foreign land just what my home country, my home government, my home sovereign stands for. So who is your God? But a second duty an ambassador has is not only the duty of education, but secondly, the duty of diplomacy. Diplomacy. It falls to the task of the ambassador in many situations to somehow take two situations where two parties are at odds with one another and to use diplomacy in the attempt to bring them together in a peaceful resolution. I read, I read that in the ancient Roman Empire there were essentially two kinds of provinces. There were senatorial provinces and imperial provinces. I read that the senatorial provinces were those provinces that were at peace with Rome, at peace with the empire. They had surrendered to Rome. They had submitted themselves to Rome's leadership, and they were at peace and willing to do what Rome asked. But then there were the imperial provinces. The imperial provinces were those provinces that were always on the edge, always in danger of rebelling against Rome, always in danger of saying, we've had enough, we won't do any more. We want independence. Guess where Rome sent its ambassadors? It sent its ambassadors to those imperial provinces because they had to go there and in an attempt at diplomacy somehow bring peace between the empire and the province. There's a way that we can come together and settle this. I wonder if Paul was drawing upon that image as he thought about the people of his world, as he put quill to parchment and wrote to them, we are Christ's ambassadors. What if he had had, with undimmed prophetic eye, the ability to see all the way down to our world, our day and time? What if he had known the fracturing planet we call Earth, its rebellion against God? He would probably have underlined it. We are Christ ambassadors. He would have said, make sure they know, make sure they know in the world out there that God intends them no evil. He intends them no harm. He wants peace with them. He wants to bring them to his heart. He wants a forever friendship with any who happen to be willing. Did you know that you are an ambassador? As an ambassador, your task is to somehow bring those people to a God who seeks to love them. April 2001, U.S. News and World Report reported the story. It seems that the chief of security in Gaza was traveling in a car, a motorcade of some sort, was traveling along when he came under intense Israeli fire. He was frightened. He could see he was not going to make it out of this alive. It was a dangerous and a deadly situation. And so the chief of Gaza called on the phone, took his phone and punched in the number and called Yasser Arafat and essentially said, Help! We've been attacked. Help! Yasser Arafat hung up the phone and dialed the number of a U.S. ambassador. When he got that ambassador, someone he knew on the phone, he essentially said, help, and expressed the situation to the ambassador. The ambassador hung up the phone and called the secretary of state, who was named Colin Powell. And he said to Powell, help, and he described exactly what was happening. 
Pal hung up the phone and punched in the number of Ariel Sharon. And he said to Sharon, stop. And Sharon hung up the phone and issued the order. And the gunfire ceased. And the security officer was safe. It's amazing when you have connections, when you know the right people, but do you know what? You have connections. You know the right person. And those people about you, those who surround you, who are falling and who are failing and who are fearful and who feel like they are being overwhelmed by a torrent of darkness and know not where to turn, and all they can do is scream out, Help! They look to you. You are the ambassador for the kingdom of God. It is up to you to be able to somehow take that feeble hand and take the strong hand you hold with the other and clasp the two together. Because ambassadors must work at diplomacy. Peace with God. So what does an ambassador do? An ambassador's job is education. What kind of God do you represent? An ambassador's job is diplomacy. We urge you to be reconciled to the God who seeks you. But there's a third task the ambassador has. It's an interesting task because it can easily become superficial. It's the task of public relations. It's the task of projecting an image to a foreign nation of what the country back at home is. It can very easily become a mile wide and an inch deep. But what we seek, what we seek are ambassadors who have a depth to be able to represent the kingdom of God. In fact, if you noticed in our passage, Paul uses the word us or we about five times, us, 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 us. He's saying, in essence, all of this ministry of recon reconciliation, it has been given to us. God doesn't sidestep human beings in order to carry out something in the world. He uses every human being. The key thing is just to remember where your true home is. Secretary of State George Shultz, when he served in that position, would bring ambassadors into his office, would talk to them about the duty, about what they were going to need to take care of, what they were going to need to carry out. He would take them over to a globe he had in his office, and he would say to them, Now point me to your country. And unfailingly, every time, fortunately, they were able to point to the country they would serve. That happened every time until Mike Mansfield became ambassador to Japan. Schultz had him in the office and went through what he had to go through with him, and then he took him over to the globe, and he said to him, Now, Mansfield... Point me to your country. And Mansfield spun the globe and stopped it and then pointed to the United States of America. He said, that's my country. Do you want to know which country I'm going to serve? I'll point Japan. But this is my country. Schultz changed how he did things after that because he recognized the reality, we must know where we're from. It is only in knowing where we're from that we then become able to portray to the world the correct and the authentic image of our homeland. So public relations. We can run around putting up all kinds of signs. We can put things on the Internet. We can make movies. We can do everything possible to have a good image. But the only question that really matters is, are we accurately, faithfully, with integrity, representing the kingdom of God? That's all that ultimately matters. That is our homeland. So how do we do that? Well, we've often called it evangelism. We at times have called it witnessing. Sometimes we've called it sharing. 
We've called it by different names, but in essence, we take our kingdom and throw open its gates and tell people this is what it's all about, and we would love to have you as a part of it. Do you want to know something about how the ultimate ambassador, Jesus Christ, did that? Listen to these words from Ellen White, the book Ministry of Healing. Listen to what she writes. Christ's method alone will have success in reaching people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bade them, follow me. Did you catch that? Mingled with them. Won their sympathy. Help them in their needs. You know how I would summarize that? I would summarize that with the word relationship. Relationship. Do you understand how many times we have done damage to our kingdom, the kingdom of God, by the way we have attempted to portray its image to other people? Tell me, exactly how do you feel if somebody stops you on the sidewalk, punches you in the chest with a tract and said, Are you saved? You know what I want to do? Well, never mind that. Let me tell you what I do by way of comparison. By way of comparison, I do the same thing that I do at home on my computer when I get spam email. I just hit the delete button. I read you the words of Mike Beckley. Mike Beckley, Beckley, author and speaker, writes about this thing he calls spam evangelism and whether or not it does any good. Listen to Beckley's words. He says, a college classmate of mine decided to walk down Central Avenue in Phoenix at lunchtime and ask women to kiss him. Just walk down the avenue. Approach women, would you kiss me, would you kiss me, would you kiss me, one after another. He wanted to see how many he would have to ask before somebody finally took him up on it. After being repeatedly cursed, ignored, and slapped at least a couple of times, the 98th woman gave him a kiss. Number 98. Using the logic of spam evangelism, he might say, it was worth it because I actually got one to kiss me. I got one. It took a while, but I got one. Beckley continues. But what I wonder about is the other 97 women. The 97 women who now are more hardened than ever, more suspicious, and more wary of men approaching them on the street. In the same way, I think a lot of unbelievers have been hardened by aggressive witnessing techniques. And so Paul says, we are Christ's ambassadors. As though God is beseeching you through us. We are the inescapable reality God has chosen. And we have to let them know what the kingdom is, but make relationship primary. Building relationships for the kingdom of God. And so we come back to our question. What is the best thing you can do for your God? I don't know what your choice might be. The Scripture is filled with options and possibilities. But I can tell you my choice. I think the very best thing we can do for our God is to recognize that Paul does not say, try to be ambassadors or think about being ambassadors or even pray to be ambassadors. He says none of those. He simply says, we are Christ's ambassadors. So maybe the best thing we can do is to be ambassadors who are faithful and authentic. It means we have to educate what kind of God do we serve. It means we need diplomacy. God is interested in peace with you. And it means that we stand portraying an image of what the kingdom of God is all about. But what about it? If we take seriously Paul's words, and live as authentic, faithful ambassadors. That just might be the very best thing we can do for our God. Yeah.